Hello guys, my name is Anna and I vlog daily from Ukraine and also I invite people I respect, people I follow uh, to my YouTube channel for serious conversations. And today I am extremely honored to talk with Vlad Wexler, whom I follow actively for more than a year and I know that many of you watch him and include your quotations, Vlad, in the comments below some of my videos. And I can introduce you as a truly global modern philosopher and a guide. You explain complicated things in very vivid illustrations and personally with your help I have changed a couple of my opinions, which is rare. And uh, also you are a kind of person I can like talk to, quarrel with, uh, without your actual presence, which I think is a part of a genius, only with popular authors with uh, really interesting thinkers, we can develop this internal conversation and hold them for a pretty long period of time. So I'm very happy to meet you on the channel and to have final this real conversation with you. Good to be with you. I actually planned uh, our talk to be uh, in two parts. In the very first part, I would like us to focus on more global things. On your channel, you help people to navigate through this complicated modern world. And being in a Ukrainian during the times of war, I felt different things. Sometimes I felt lonely, alone in this big world. Sometimes just the country. I felt how connected we are. And I will start with one question that people actually stopped asking. It is about the beginning of Russian war in Ukraine. And did you feel it coming? And why? Because you are a different kind of a person, not like a military expert that often talk about that, not a politician, but a philosopher, a very um, attentive observer of Russian society, of global society. Did you feel it coming and why? I'm thinking. I felt a conflict coming from about 2015 onward but I didn't necessarily think it would be with Ukraine I thought there'd be a good chance it would be with one of the Baltic states so mm -hmm. what I felt coming was a transformation in certainly in Putin's psychology that took on a more missionary dimension, right? People go loopy after staying too long in power. And one of the ways in which that manifests is that they begin to think that somehow their personal biography is entwined with the development of their culture. Lots of people talk about this and people debate whether that turn in Putin developed earlier or later, but I'm going to date it to about 2010 to 2014. So I felt something was on the cards. What I specifically felt about Ukraine in the weeks and months running up to the um, invasion is a, a bit complex. I thought that there would be a military action against Ukraine. And I thought that, and it doesn't matter terribly much what I thought, I don't think it's a political philosopher's job to predict a war. So it's not a professional opinion, just asking me how I felt. Um, I thought that there was a, perhaps a 60-70% chance of bombardment across all Ukrainian territory. Mm -hmm. And I thought there was maybe about a 15-20% chance of a full-scale invasion. The reason I thought that, one of the reasons I thought that, is that the kind of war that Putin started against you, his regime and his state 
was not ready for. His, mm -hmm. his regime was ready for something that was partly an invasion, but partly just a coup. And so Putin would need to reformat his regime in order to make it compatible with the kind of war that he was inevitably going to pursue. So that's, I think, where I was at. Um, I knew, like most people did, but perhaps Putin didn't, that he wasn't invading Ukraine in 2013. Uh, he was invading Ukraine in 2022. And there was no doubt that uh, this was going to be felt by Ukrainians as uh, a ghastly act of imperialist violence that must be resisted at all costs. Um, so I thought that a full scale of inv invasion of Ukraine would uh, have to be such a big deal for Putin to engage in that it would need the reformatting of the Russian state, the reformatting of his regime. And that's what we began to see in a hurried way after the invasion. And what we've seen recently with the assassination of Prigozhin, with the Prigozhin mutiny, is evidence of the fact that the Putin regime is not set up for the kind of war it is conducting in Ukraine. Why did he decide to hurry? Because the, since 2014, many, and even before 2014, many of his really violent actions, breaking international agreements, were tolerated by the world, not to escalate. And then why did he decide to do it on the 24th of February 2022? I think that there are two comments I could make without answering your question directly. One is that Putin doesn't understand contemporary Ukraine. He doesn't mm -hmm. want contemporary Ukraine to be what it is. And for him, history rather stops um, in 2014. In some ways, it stops in the 19th century, but it stops in 2014. So he wasn't thinking he was invading the kind of Ukraine he was invading. And the second thought I have is that Putin has a special theory about the imminent decline of the West. And he was confident that um, the West would not react quite as strongly as it did. Um, now, partly he thought that because he thought the operation could be taken care of in, the, in a few days, it wouldn't be a, a, a ghastly large-scale imperialist war. Um, but he thought the West would yield and be less, mm -hmm. uh, be, be less recalcitrant. So I think that what made him make these mistakes as badly as he made them, both about misunderstanding Ukraine and misunderstanding the West, is COVID isolation. I think that mm -hmm. that exaggerated his trouble with having monitors switched on to planet Earth. That's just part of, that's just part of the answer. I think um, a more sober Putin would have tried to do this quite a lot earlier or quite a lot later. Mm -hmm. When we were not prepared at all or when something different would be happening around the world. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, when the West would be weaker. Uh, and he thinks that will happen in, in the next five years, let's say. And he was also investing to some extent in the problems of the West. Uh, to a great extent, this war uh, taught us um, the essence of unpredictability. Uh, like, I did not believe full-scale war is possible. Then war is so dynamic, uh, things change so quickly uh, that many of results, many of, like anything, uh, cannot be predicted. And one of the things that I try to transmit to my subscribers is that, like, in Ukraine you don't plan, you cannot, like, of course, you do on this some local level, but you are never sure. And this also um, continues to this global uh, stage, I'd say, this total unpredictability of Russian war in Ukraine. Sometimes 
when we feel like losing something, we tell ourselves, well, we don't know, something may happen in Russia. Uh, on country, when we feel that we are successful, uh, we think, well, we don't know, something may happen. And this something may be something really unpredictable, something illogical, irrational, beautiful or ugly. Um, how do you think, to what extent this unpredictability plays role in this war? Is it a common thing for all wars? Or is it a product of this chaotic Putin's uh, regime? Or is it not connected with war and just a part of our living that we see so vividly in such challenging times? Mm, I feel you. That's a great question. I think that one of the evils of war is its unpredictability. War is evil anyway, but it's so evil that you can do all the right things. And in fact, everything can be going your way, but even that isn't a guarantee of a good outcome. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a humbling thing. And it's something that a lot of Ukrainians feel who are fighting. It's harder to feel from the outside. And it creates one of the things that I've described as the gamification of war. People are looking at Ukraine as a junior football team beating a, a, a football team that's supposed to be much better, but seemingly is having trouble playing against Ukraine. And so one of the, one of the dangers of that is that it doesn't, this doesn't respect this... Um, extraordinarily painful truth about war that um, there is a contingency to it that can always turn against you. I mean, let's take a, an example. Imagine that Ukraine's counteroffensive stalls and that the war roughly freezes in the place in which it's at now. But then imagine a second scenario in which Ukraine breaks Russia's bridge to Crimea, even retakes Crimea, right? Um, even what these two scenarios mean isn't certain and isn't set in stone. It could be that the first scenario is then accompanied by the Putin regime collapsing and Russia experiencing dramatic changes and not posing a threat anymore. Whereas the second scenario could be accompanied by a second Ukrainian war with Russia successfully retaking Crimea in 2030. So you see, that, that's part of the evil of war, that even everything going as you would like it to um, isn't a guarantee that you're going to land exactly where you need to. So there is this absolutely... Um, sort of visceral precarity. And that's, I think, one of the things that makes starting a war such an evil act, right? You're putting human beings in that situation. Um, so uh, there is absolutely no way uh, beyond that for Ukraine until there are um, the conditions for not just a peace, but a lasting peace and very strong security guarantees. So it's, it's an incredibly and inherently uh, stressful and unpredictable situation. It is. And it's so weird uh, how you adapt to these changes. And sometimes war is present in minor details, not only in explosions and like, I don't know, tanks traveling by mm -hmm. your house. Uh, I remember watching one of your videos, I guess on your philosophy channel, uh, where you said one phrase, uh, it was like, it. I felt it during some difficult times, losing my mom, trying to understand why war is a question like this is a question that many Ukrainians were asking why and you said like universe is indifferent and it's true like it's it, it exists according to some physical laws it's a huge dark space with stars see it beautiful or empty but people are not indifferent and uh, one of the beautiful things that I observed during this war is the continued support 
very varied support, starting from strong political voices and real patriot systems coming, finishing with some messages, and even those people who watch my channel for the sake of updates that they could simply ignore, living in their normal environment and hoping it will not come to their land and it may not. How do you feel? Um, has the world changed with this war? Uh, during this a year and a half? Uh, or is it the, like the illusion that we have being in the epicenter of events or have some serious, like, I don't know, um, civilizational cracks or shifts uh, happened globally? Mm. You mean because of the war? Because of the war, mm. because of seeing the war, living mm. with this... Yeah. Online, yeah. to some extent, this war is unusual a bit because you learn not from newspapers, not from books, but you physically observe it online if you want to. Mm. Well, first, let me say that, you know, I know you've carried a lot this year and I just want to acknowledge that and I'm, I'm proud of you. Um, in terms of the impact um, of the war on how the world sees the world, Mm -hmm. There has been a reckoning with what Russia is, the kind of state that Russia is in, but perhaps not for everyone. That's to say, there are still many political agents and forces in the major Western capitals that would like to go back to pre-February um, 24, 2022. That's to say they would like Putin to calm down. Mm -hmm. And that's a very basic misunderstanding in my view of the project that's coming out of the Kremlin. But I think that that opinion is prevalent. I would say it's perhaps half of um, what is thought in the corridors of Western power. I think people have been extraordinarily inspired by Ukraine over the past year and a half, by the civic coming together of Ukrainian society, by the survival of the Ukrainian state, um, by the... Um, power of the Ukrainian military. Um, so it's felt like a very magical story. But I don't think that it's as yet inspired significant democratic momentum at home. I think there's a lot of talk about um, Ukraine's very fragile democracy inspiring older decaying democracies to refresh themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversation about that i think however the extent to which that's really made an impact is is limited but i think that in many ways the world's attention is still on ukraine and one of the difficult questions we're facing is how long is that going to last the other thing worth saying here that's perhaps connected with the point I made about Russia is that the war has not led to a deep reassessment of what security arrangements um, in Eastern Europe should be. That reassessment is limited still in some ways. And one of the clear signs in which it's limited is that the West at the moment doesn't have a policy toward Russia. It has a Ukraine policy. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I am passionate about pointing out is that we've got to think about how to politicize the Russian space. And it's not just Russians who can do that. The Russian opposition are trying to do that. And they're not succeeding at the moment, but it's a hard task. But this is also something that we should be doing. And I believe this is something that Ukraine should be doing. It's very hard to swallow 
a point that says know thy enemy. But knowing thy enemy is a very important thing for one's own future security arrangements uh, because Ukraine cannot solve its problems unless certain things happen on Belarusian territory, on Russian territory too. And what I'm saying is that major Western powers have not been moved by what we've seen over the past 18 months yet to develop a strategic picture of what they want to see happen on this extraordinary territory that particularly involves Belarus mm -hmm. and Russia. And all, all they have done is made two very clear commitments. One is that Ukraine must survive and remain independent, and two, that the war must not uh, escalate, that the war must not go nuclear and the war must not spread beyond Ukraine. That and Ukraine's survival together has been the, the center of Western policy. To that extent, they have been very successful in doing what they want. But the question is, are there other things that they might have wanted and could have pushed for? And that's an important and open question we need to keep coming, coming back to. I'm actually very grateful for your works on your channel because from what I see, I haven't met anyone else speaking so much about this future, the future of Russia, the future of the world, the future of uh, Ukraine. And the more I think about this victory, what is victory, right? Um, the more I realize that we need talks, we need constructions, we need some kind of visualization, because even if we do not manage to achieve that, it's much easier to walk in that direction. You know, what made lots of Ukrainians angry about NATO, not the fact that we are not members, we realize it's impossible at the moment, but some clear lines that you need to follow to achieve something. And many people are still very much afraid of collapse of Russia. And they see that sometimes I feel they are more afraid of this than of the nuclear war. <laughs> they always equate it. And uh, also, uh, I see that many um, global thinkers from countries that n were never close with Russia do not fully understand its like philosophy and they are trying to focus on mending, repairing, trying to find a solution when sometimes only a collapse or some serious reconstruction is uh, possible. Uh, do you think there is a way to um, engage more people, more intellectuals, more people, I don't like this phrase, but decision makers or decision inspirers? into this future vision of Russia, future vision of uh, Eastern Europe, Europe, global security systems, because uh, sometimes even Ukrainians want to return back into before 2020, but we mm -hmm. very well realize it's impossible. It's just impossible. And this new world, for ex at least for us, it has already appeared. And now it's chaotic. Mm. I think there are two things there. One is the collapse of the Putin regime, and the other is the collapse of Russia. And they're not they're not connected. <laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> Um, they're not connected. Well, I'm not going to cheer the collapse of Russia because that's just an outcome that might happen or might not. Um, what I think your point about Western policymakers. I think rightly grasps is that um, we've got to think about getting past the Putin regime. You're not going to get Western policymakers to support the disintegration of Russia into small parts. That's that's not a start. It's not going to happen. Um, but what 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 is a much bigger problem is that many Western policymakers are still not imagining a post-Putin world. Mm -hmm. They That's... still treat him as a president. They call him a criminal. They issue an order. They don't allow him to travel, but they still listen to him. What we are looking for, of course, is not moral condemnation of Putin. That's not here or there. We're looking for a, 
a strategy which says we are looking for a post-Putin world in everything we do and everything we say. Um, that is a psychological disposition, but it's also mm -hmm. something that's going to affect everything. It's going to affect what you say to um, the Russian population, to the Russian regime, to the Russian opposition, to Ukraine, to the Ukrainian government. The West is not saying, hey, Ukrainian government, listen, this is what we want to have happen in the Russian space. So uh, we'll give you more weapons, but could you support us with our ideas about that? No, there is no, there is no plan for that space. That conversation is um, in a very uh, delimited state. So that's, the, that's the, the first point. And I think that it's very important to say that I, I think there is movement on this. It's, it's, we shouldn't be too ambitious about it, but there is some movement. There are people talking about looking beyond Putin, and there are people talking about having a regime change psychology, as difficult as that is. By that, I don't mean that you, you're going to go in and change the regime in Russia. Uh, by that, I simply mean that the strategy is that Putin is done. He's played his cards. He could stay in power for a long time. He could even beat us. But we are going to think of getting to a world that is a world that follows the collapse of his regime. We're going to try to bring that world about as much as possible. So lots of people are talking about this more. Just the other day, I heard the historian uh, Steve Kotkin talk about this, the way that um, I am seeing more people go there. So I think that's, that's the first part. That's really important. Mm -hmm. In terms of the collapse of Russia itself, um, this needs to be a political conversation. It cannot be, I mean, it can, it's not illegal. Uh, it's not illegal to draw a map and break Russia up into 77 <laughs> bits and then, and then raise a glass of wine to that. Nobody's going to Nobody's going to arrest you for that. But um, that is gesture and that is um, a kind of moral and aesthetic move. It can be very satisfying, especially if, you know, you're breaking up the um, evil invader you're trying to fight off. Uh, but what we need here is politics. And that means that... Um, we ask, first of all, what are the realistic possibilities that this might happen? And given our assessment of that, what, what should we do? What should we think? What should we say? I mean, it, it, it is important in the end that these things should be decided by the people who live on that territory, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to impose Russian imperialism and then go around saying, well, I've decided Russia needs to break up into 17 different things. So ideally what you're looking for is the creation of a kind of political environment, and that's optimistic, of course, in which people who live on these territories get to have their say. And mm -hmm. that means that they get to face a question that they have some political control over, which is, what do we have in common with all of these other people living on this territory? Right? And what I'm saying is that eventually Russia will run into that question and it'll either be able to answer that question or it won't. Um, and um, what one hopes, however, is that a situation is brought about um, in which all of these people get a chance to have a say, and then we're going to have to follow what their say is. The trouble, of course, is that's a very optimistic picture. It's predicated on some process of federalization and democratization in Russia. And the alternative to that is a much more uh, violent and unpredictable uh, breakup, the consequences of which we can't assess. If you wanted somebody who has written about this provocatively and thoughtfully and who genuinely thinks that the chances that Russia will break up are very high, that's Sasha Etkin, Alexander Etkin. He is a professor mm -hmm. in Vienna at the moment. And he is probably the commentator I'd most recommend if you wanted to explore a strongly 
pro Russia breakup perspective, at least at the level of what may happen, not at the level mm -hmm. of um, whether it will be a disaster or not. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Definitely. Thank you for the advice. And as a language sensitive person, I sometimes think we should start saying not collapse of Russia, but something like liberation of uh, Russian peoples <laughs> or to make it more positive in the minds of many people. But in the end, these people have to be part of your conversation, right? You can't just be a Latvian academic in Seattle breaking of Russia course. up. You, you have to have the understanding that we don't want to do imperialism. And not doing imperialism means we have to say, well, let's, let's hope for and try to bring about a situation in which people who live on that territory get a say in mm -hmm. this and that they get to face in a politically constructive rather than a destructive way the question, what holds us all together? And that is going to be a question Russia will run into after the collapse of the Putin regime. What holds us all together? Thank you. Another question is perhaps like to summarize this uh, first global part of our conversation, but it still returns us back to Russia. And before I ask this question, I would like to remind that I'm a Ukrainian at war and sometimes some of my remarks may be too emotional because I'm not like neutral. And at the same time, I often speak against Russian vloggers, people who do not share their like open opinion against Putin, people who manipulate all of that. But in general, if you'd ask me what do I feel towards Russian people, I would say I feel sorry for them. I cannot say that I sympathize or I feel much compassion because I believe they should do something. But from the other point of view, it's a surprising fact that many Ukrainians being in the country that is targeted with missiles daily would never agree to switch and become Russian. Like we would not like to experience Russian Absolutely. lifestyle. Absolutely. And that's like very vivid. And uh, we can, I, I believe that the fall of Putin's regime is something we can expect. It's likely. It must happen. It's more realistic than, for example, the quick collapse of Russia. It's more realistic. But when you look deeper in the darkness of Russian history, imperial history, you see that every decade, every 50 years or something, they give birth to another uh, authoritarian monster that they like, just like Stalin, who is still a hero. Uh, is there something like Ron uh, inherently in their understanding of power? Is it because of one period of traumas? But then I start thinking about Ukrainians who were part of Soviet Union, experienced Red Terror, Holodomor, other stuff, and did not start liking this kind of um, rule. Is it something that can be changed and how? For Russia not to produce new Putin in 25 years. There isn't any country in the world that is inherently unsuitable for at least some form of democracy. Um, Russia, China, North Korea are all entirely suitable for democracy, um, partly because they're constituted of human beings. So in principle, the answer about every place in the world has to be Yes. For it not to be yes, something would need to be true about human psychology um, that I think isn't, that I think isn't true. However, extremely persistent historical conditions obtain and it can take years, decades to climb out of them. I think that Russia's biggest problem today is probably what I would call depoliticization. There's a very big problem that neighbors that, and that's what you've just put on the table, which is the problem of a kind of 
revanchism and a kind of resentment, a kind of um, twig that feels like mm -hmm. it has to bounce back after experiencing humiliation. So it's both. But I would say that the first problem is bigger because more of the population are more exhaustively caught up in it, right? Um, something like, let us say, 50 to 70 percent of the population are proactively avoiding politics. Mm -hmm. And that is not necessarily an I love Stalin position. It's a position which says, I'll say anything you want about Stalin and leave me alone. Now, within that demographic, are there extraordinarily um, unlovely currents swimming about that um, create the possibility for sympathy with all kinds of unlovely bits of Russian history and create some sympathy with a kind of tyrannical rule they're experiencing now? Yeah, sure, that's, that's there. But I think the primary bit is the extraordinary level of depoliticization, which is a kind of a natural product of the 90s, an extraordinary breakdown of faith that anything can mm -hmm. be achieved in, with politics at all. And that organic breakdown was followed then by a systematic attempt to, to create this breakdown by the Putin project that's been doing this for two decades very effectively. In terms of Stalin fancy, or Stalin fancy in the form of magical thinking, right? Like not Stalin, but some kind of substitute, cultural substitute, as we discussed a year ago in the last time we yeah. spoke, uh, putting in some kind of cultural substitute instead of Stalin. I think that, now again, I'm not, I'm a philosopher, I'm not an expert on the ethnographic reality of Russian society, but I would say this is something that very much affects Russians as you go into the older generations. So mm -hmm. I think this is a problem for the over 60s. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is that some people in their 40s and 50s have been partly caught up in it too, but the regime needed to do a lot of work to get them there. They weren't naturally so disposed to go there. But the over 60s, I think, um, are there in uncomfortable, in com uncomfortable numbers. So that is a problem. But when it comes to the younger generation, something like radical depoliticization is much more of a problem um, than um, fancy for some kind of bizarre monarch to rule over them. Altogether, it seems to me, Russia's younger generations are more in line with you and me than, than the older folks. Um, and part of the reason Putin started this was because he realized this. He wanted to, he wanted to do something about an imminent crisis of perceived legitimacy he was running mm -hmm. running into, um, which is, of course, extraordinarily evil um, to create um, a brutal imperial war to solve regime security issues.